Nu ga ik de doctorand dus uit om zijn doctoraatsonderzoek voor te stellen. Boris, veel succes. So first I would like to thank everybody for uh, this is kind of a special uh, defense because you have all have uh, virtual reality devices so it will be a virtual reality presentation. Uh, so if you're ready, uh, no, wait a bit <laughs> more. Uh, so if you have trouble with the VR devices then you can just raise your hand. There are two, three people in the back that are uh, will help you if something's wrong. Uh, this is a bit of a special presentation, so I will try a few things out. Maybe not everything works. So it will help me a lot. If you see something really nice that you remember what it was and uh, tell it to me afterwards. Uh, the converse is also true. So if you see something you really don't like, uh, yeah, inform me about it and I can improve in future. Uh, virtual reality, some people are sensitive to the format, so it could be that you feel nauseous during this presentation. And if this happen, uh, happens, I would advise you to, as quickly as possible, remove the headset. There is an alternative here, a screen, so you can still follow the presentation. So uh, that's a bit the introduction. So now you might uh, want to put, up, put on the headset. And again, if somebody has some trouble or anything, just raise your hand. So everybody ready? Then we will start. So if you see me, you see me to the right here. Uh, and what I'm doing here is making the front page of my thesis. So this is real, uh, no Photoshop. Uh, and why is this my front page? Well, because it contains the three most important elements of my thesis. First, you see a big car frame. This is a complicated object that is being produced in a factory. And this, uh, this frame can have some errors related to the production or the materials that are used. And this is not good because nobody wants damaged goods or it could be that it cannot take all the loads that it's designed for and it might break if there are some production errors there. So that's why it's important to inspect objects before uh, you go further in the production or uh, deliver some goods. And to do that, yeah, inspections are, ne are necessary. Uh, just visual uh, inspections by somebody are not really uh, enough sometimes because there can be subsurface defects or whatever, things that are not visual. And that's why you have measurement devices that uh, do the inspections. And this is also visualized here. You see, for example, a projector and a camera. This can be an inspection device uh, to measure defects. Then you see the orange thing there, that's an industrial robot, so it doesn't look like a terminator or so. But this uh, device is used to move the measurement device around. So you cannot inspect an entire object from one position, so you need to move it around to get complete measurements. Now one quantity that you might want to inspect is the dimensions of an object. For example, if this frame is bent, it could be that it cannot take all the loads and this can result in accidents. So we don't want that. So we want to verify if the product has the right dimensions. Another example is that you see holes and things are attached to these holes in a later stage of the production. If these are on the wrong position, then yeah, it can cause trouble later on. So that's why you might to inspect this. There are a lot of different measurement techniques that are used to uh, measure uh, the dimensions of something. Uh, but in my thesis, I will focus not focus on specific techniques, but on a generality, a general approach uh, to, yeah, a general approach that applies to all of these different measurement devices. 
Uh, so the goal I'm trying to solve in my measure in my uh, PhD thesis was how do I find uh, measurement trajectories for the robot such that the measurement device that is attached to it can perform complete high quality measurements. And we want to do that in an efficient manner. Uh, important is that it is general for more devices because uh, if, I, if the techniques only work for one device, it's not really useful. Uh, so that's why we want the generality. Another thing that you might want to inspect is the thermal reaction of an object. Uh, this is because air heats up slower than aluminum, for example. So if there are some small cracks or subsurface air bubbles, then these uh, cause a change in how something warms up. And uh, that's also, uh, that's a field called active thermography, for example, that uh, uses this thermal response to uh, inspect an object for small cracks or subsurface defects. So we not only focus on dimensional inspection, but also, for example, thermography. So this generality is not for uh, specific quantities that you might want to measure, but also for different quantities. So uh, all, inspection all inspection times actually. So uh, I said earlier that a measurement device can only measure at a certain uh, a part of the object at one position. You see that that's the case uh, if you want to measure the thermal response. But this is also the case for dimensional inspection. So this also, uh, already indicates uh, that if you want to uh, find robot paths to get complete measurements, that from that perspective, these problems are uh, really related. And that's also why we can study it generally. Another focus of my thesis is on how that how the people that need these algorithms use them. So I can make an algorithm that only I can use, but that's not really useful to the industry. So that's also an important focus of my research. So uh, now that you know about the problem, let's see what I did to solve it. Uh, you're now in a new environment, so I give you a few moments to look around. And here again, you see the three main elements of my thesis, an industrial robot, a measurement device that is attached to it, and an object that we want to inspect. This time it's a bicycle frame, but it can actually be any kind of geometry that is being produced uh, somewhere. And my first reflex was to create an automated algorithm to solve it, because it's easy to use, right? You just... Uh, so uh, supply the algorithm with the right information and it solves the problem automatically. That's why I uh, draw the huge computer above it. But let's see how uh, somebody would use this algorithm. Okay, so this is some VR mistake, so this doesn't work. So let me just tell you about it. So the user has to provide uh, the geometry to it, then uh, the details about the measurement device, and also the robot that is being used. And it, the method is really flexible in that, so you can have any kind of robot, any kind of object, and any kind of measurement device. Uh, this produces, uh, with that information, a measurement path, and this path, uh, the measurement device will travel along this path, and the robot can make it follow that path. So the robot should be able to reach those positions. So it's not really nice that you cannot see the inspection right now because it would have been informative. Uh, but something, some visualization that I will use a lot is that there uh, will be colors displayed on the bicycle frame. If I simulate an inspection and if the colors turn blue, this means that you have a good inspection. If they are yellow, not, a, not as good an inspection, and if the bike frame would still be white, uh, then it's not measured. But normally you would see that the algorithm can find a solution to this problem uh, with good inspection quality. But we don't have that right now, so let's see what kind of problems that can be solved by the algorithm that yeah, I developed in this thesis. 
So you probably recognize this place. This is the place where we started the introduction. Uh, so uh, we've given the robot some extra capabilities of movement. So you can see that it can slide along a rail because if we keep the pace of the robot fixed then it couldn't do a lot, so that wouldn't be interesting. So without further ado, let's see what the algorithm generates as the inspection path for this uh, complex problem. So this will take uh, a while to do. Uh, so I can tell you a bit about the algorithm itself because I'm not the first to create an algorithm like this, but uh, typically you have two kinds of algorithms. The one algorithm that tries to mathematically define the problem and find good solutions to it. Uh, but these problems have typical, these algorithms typically do not scale to complex problems like this, for example. The other kind of algorithms uh, try to be practical and solve problems uh, from this complexity, but they have no mathematical guarantees. This algorithm bridges the gap between the two types of algorithms. So you see it can generate an inspection pot for this complex problem, but it also has nice mathematical guarantees. And you see if we compare uh, this algorithm with the mathematical guarantees that this uh, performs slightly better than uh, if you don't have the mathematical guarantee. So they mean something in uh, practice. So, so you visually see that almost everything uh, of the car frame is nicely colored in. So that means that there are measurements of the surface of, on every part. And most of it is blue, so high quality measurements. Uh, some parts are still red, but that's because we didn't give the algorithm along uh, enough time. So if you give it more time, then it can uh, make even better paths, but it's dependent on what you want from your algorithm. So now let's see something else that can be solved by uh, this algorithm. So sometimes in my office I'm staring in front of me, but actually in my imagination, imagination I see something like this, so I'm not just staring, I'm doing something. Uh, but this algorithm is really general, so uh, I said you can supply any kind of robot to it. So here you see, for example, a small drone that is doing the inspection, that's also a robot. And the geometry is not a car frame or a bicycle frame, but it's an entire wind turbine. So you see if you supply these things to the algorithm, then it can also generate a path for this. So the problem of inspection planning uh, is really a general pro problem. Okay, so you probably believe me if I say that if you give it some more time, it will cover everything. That is kind of boring, so let's move on to the more exciting content. Okay, so uh, we are actually in this uh, huge computer that you saw above the scene, and we are here because we, I need to talk about the problem you have. Uh, you see me to, your, to my left through my screen, so this means that we are in my computer. That's a uh, def definitive proof of that. And a problem that occurs in a practical factory is that you have a lot of elements that are not really foreseen. So if you have, for example, light that shines through a window, or you have lights in your factory, then they might interact with your inspection technique because a lot of these techniques are based on light. And uh, an important aspect is that I, as a user of the algorithm, need to make this clear to the algorithm because the algorithm needs to take this into account. And automated algorithms uh, have a bit of a problem with this because I will, I for example, I would be able to steer the algorithm in a direction, but I made the algorithm so I know more about it than uh, usual people. So I would tweak with these parameters, for example. But to somebody that doesn't know about this algorithm, it's, yeah, it makes no sense what they do. So it's hard to interact with it uh, by tweaking with the parameters for somebody that doesn't know. So that's why we have a different approach, an approach that makes use of virtual reality. See, you see me here in virtual reality. 
And if you compare how this method works, normally an automated algorithm makes use of an abstraction of the problem, and this abstraction allows a computer to solve this problem automatically. So if you want to interact with the algorithm, you have to interact with this abstraction, and that is difficult. My approach here is just let the user solve it himself. Just, he can do it in virtual reality himself, but we will develop techniques that help him in this process. And if he needs to do it himself, he can take whatever into account what he wants, and it's easy to interact with it that way. So, yeah. So here we are in a car park. Uh, this is a reconstruction from images, by the way, for people that are interested in, interested in that. And we take a detour along a different problem. This is the camera network design problem. Uh, you see these green cameras on the ceiling. Uh, the goal of this problem is to position these cameras such that every area of the scene is visible. Yeah, let me see. Okay, so let's now see what uh, technique I developed here. Uh, okay. We did this. Is it clear what this is? No, I will explain it. So you see red clouds in the environment, and these red clouds indicate what's not visible by any camera and we help the user by visualizing this in VR. And the person can use this uh, to move the cameras in correct positions and he can see the, in real time the effect on this uh, volume. We can use uh, advanced volume rendering for that. And you see that it's actually interactive. So if you see on top of the pillar near the ceiling, you see me in VR and interacting with it, and you see that in real time the volume changes based on how I move the cameras. So by rendering this, I can help a user in designing camera networks. So you might think if a person just needs to do everything himself, aren't these camera networks worse than a camera network that is designed by an algorithm? We also thought that might be the case, and that's why we did an experiment. And that's what you see here. You see me performing the experiment. So you see in front of you in VR what I saw in VR, me to the right, and on the left you see what I see through my VR glasses. And what we tried to this experiment, in this experiment uh, the user needed to place 25 cameras in his office environment, and the quality, uh, we wanted to maximize the total coverage of the areas which uh, is actually the same as minimizing the area of the red clouds. And we had actually some surprising results. If we compared the quality of camera networks generated by users, it was almost the same or sometimes even better than that of, that of automated algorithms. So it seems that users are naturally quite good at this task if they are helped in the correct way. And you see me doing it right here. This is actually quite relevant right now because there was uh, the news of two inmates, uh, no, not two, a few inmates that were escaped in turnout. Uh, and the problem there was that they didn't have uh, complete coverage with their camera network, so there were blind spots. So if they had uh, my interface, then they would have seen that as red clouds and knew that inmates could escape that way but they hadn't, and this is how it's usually done. So normally nobody knows these blind spots, but in VR we can visualize them nicely. So, this was the camera network design problem. Uh, now we are gonna do a similar thing with uh, robot path planning for inspections. And I'm gonna try something special uh, because we naturally, uh, we defined an algorithm, uh, no, uh, an interface that helps users, and we wanted to see if this interface is any, was any good. 
So what we wanted to try out is to compare the performance of automated algorithms again with that of a user. Uh, but we also wanted to see what's the effect of the speciality of the user. So if somebody is specialized in robotics, then maybe he's better uh, at the task than somebody that doesn't know about it. And that's also something we tried. And why didn't I explain the technique yet to you? Because uh, we're here all in VR. It's a VR experiment. So I'm going to try to recreate this experiment uh, for you. In the first step of this experiment, I trained every participant uh, in the interface, and you're actually in that training right now. You can't interact with the environment uh, the same way as the user did, and that's why you have to your right a stand-in that represents a user. So let's now see what the experiment was like. So first, there is the concept of inspection quality. Uh, the standing is to your left. And the user could, could just move a measurement device over the object, and the quality was visualized in real time on this object. So the user could move the camera around to uh, play around with this concept and get to know it. Again, uh, the, blue the blue quality indicated on the object is good. Uh, if it is yellow, then it's not as good. And you can see you can move around the camera and see in real time what's the effect. Uh, you can also uh, record pads. Uh, and then you take multiple measurements which are accumulated in the inspection quality. So if you then have different kinds of objects, you can just move the uh, camera around the object and record the pad, and you get uh, feedback on what's the quality of this pad, and then you can try a few pads out and uh, take the best one. So it's quite easily understandable for uh, even non-experts. Okay, so you probably notice, yeah, we're doing robotic inspection, but there's no robot. Well, you're too early too early because now you see a robot to your right and the user can just uh, move the robot around. It follows the controller so it's quite easy to program a robot like this. It's quite straightforward. And the technique that I didn't discuss explicitly combines these two effects. So you can move the robot around and get a real-time feedback on the quality and you can record a pad like this. So uh, this is step one. We trained uh, 15 participants this way in the interface. And let's now see what an experiment looks like. So this is exactly the way it looked like for a participant. So you can see that it's quite easy to program a pad like this. It's just like painting, actually. And what we found out in our experiments is that you don't need to be an expert to use this. So if we compare the performance of an expert in robotics or inspection with the performance of somebody that doesn't know about it, it was uh, nearly the same. So uh, the interface is really easy to understand and can be used by non-experts. And it's also easy to, yeah. Uh, now you see uh, three more inspection cases that the user had to solve. And when we compared the quality of uh, user-generated paths with that of automated algorithms, we notice that these paths are slightly less efficient. Uh, for the same inspection time, it's about 30% less, uh, lesser inspection quality. Uh, but you get extra flexibility. So you get extra flexibility at the cost of uh, quality. So it's uh, yeah, slightly less uh, quality, but still usable. So the final stage of the experiment, experiment was, uh, so it's gonna, yeah. It's one really complex inspection case. It's the inside of a wind turbine. So you see that even for really complicated objects, a user can still uh, generate inspection paths quite easily with the interface. So it's not that hard. And what we noticed is that users with this interface uh, could significantly faster uh, produce an inspection path than that of an automated algorithm. So 
uh, this means that you can, uh, in production, uh, generate a part quickly. If something's wrong with that path, then you can simply generate a new one that avo avoids these kinds of problems. Okay. So I presented to, to you one automated algorithm to solve the inspection planning problem and generate inspection parts. Uh, the problem with this algorithm was that it is hard for a non-expert to influence the final result if some uh, something occurs that needs to be avoided. To solve that, I made an approach where users could just manually generate an inspection path, uh, which is more flexible because you can take whatever into, your, into account uh, when you do that. Uh, this extra flexibility came at a bit of a cost because the inspection quality of these pads is slightly uh, less. Uh, I made a uh, another algorithm, uh, an algorithm that is a bit different. Uh, this has to do with the fact if you want to do 100 or 1000 inspections, then every second of an inspection matters. And uh, this algorithm then uh, starts with an initial path and then figures out all the details of this path to make it more and more efficient. So if you then need to do 100 of these inspections, then uh, you save a lot of time by figuring it out and this algorithm does that. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So first you need to uh, provide your uh, geometry, uh, your measurement device, and uh, the robot that you use to the algorithm. But the algorithm starts from another path that already exists. We provided two ways in which you can do that. And then makes this more efficient to execute. If you want to do a lot of inspection of a lot of objects, this matters a lot. So you see that it produces a path with the same kind of inspection quality, but more efficient. So if you don't see uh, the difference between these two paths, uh, this is because, yeah, the details matter to the robots. So it's not that it's, it's visually that clear. Uh, but the algorithm works in an iteratively, iterative way by making small adjustments to make it more and more efficient. Because it's iteratively, I can actually show you this process. So I can do that right now. So this is the original path and we can activate the algorithm and you see how the algorithm step by step makes it more and more efficient to execute. It's like a rubber band, the algorithm. So I thought about it as a rubber band that tries to shrink the path and make it more efficient. If it still isn't clear why this path is that much better, I can compare the inspection times uh, for these different kinds of uh, different paths. So let's do that right now. Uh, yeah. So you see that uh, the optimized path is almost finished and the original one is still going. And you see that by applying this uh, algorithm to the path that we can save 30% uh, uh, time, which is a lot if you do this inspection uh, Lots and lots of times. Now, uh, you haven't, you, the only thing you've seen until now is uh, simulations, but let's see in a practical case how all these things come together. So yeah, uh, this was actually kind of a bad joke, I, but just enjoy the effe effect and <laughs> I will leave the joke uh, aside because, yeah. Okay, now we are in the robotics lab of the University of Antwerp and you see a practical inspection case. So we have a bicycle frame that can be damaged. Attached to the robot, you see a thermal camera. This is a camera that can see heat. And below, slightly below that, we have a 500 watt halogen light bump, bulb that uh, can heat up an object, so it's active thermography. To your right, you see the camera feed of this camera. So what you actually see, uh, the thermal camera is looking right inside the 3D camera that is made to uh, make this uh, picture. 
and you see that it's actually giving a, uh, off a lot of heat. So that's quite interesting about it. So now we have this device, this robot already, but yeah, we don't know what to do with this robot. So luckily I made an algorithm to solve this. So if we plug all these things in the algorithm, we can generate an inspection part. So yeah, it's an industrial robot. So first you have to go to your home position, otherwise it won't do anything. So it's now going to the home position. And now you can see the algorithm that is looking for uh, different kinds of paths. This is a visualization of what the algorithm actually tries to do. Okay, so it's still looking for, uh, for paths and it nearly settles on one uh, path. Okay, so it settled, settled on a pad. So actually, in theory, we could now execute this uh, pad on the robot and perform the inspections. But this is a robotics lab and we're doing thermal, thermal ex inspections. So in a robotics lab, there are a lot of sources of heat around you. So if in one uh, measurement position, you not only see the bicycle frame that you want to inspect, but in the background, there is some source of heat that can mess up the contrast of your measurements. And in post-processing, this, this is not good and should be avoided. So if you cannot uh, make this clear to the algorithm that these sources of heat are there, then I have an alternative for you. So let's now do that. So here uh, you see me in VR, so I can actually just manually specify a path and I know where the sources of heat are. So I can avoid these kinds of uh, positions in my path. So yeah, I'm not doing a great job, but I didn't have that much time, so <laughs> forgive me for it. <laughs> and you see that it's still quite easy to generate a path manually like this. So this path will not be as efficient as that of the automated algorithm, but we have a path that we can perform. Okay, so now we have actually everything, a robot, a measurement device, an object that we want to measure, and a pad. So let's do this measurement. Okay. Okay, so the robot will start in a moment. So you see that uh, the lamp is flashing. What's actually happening is that it's sending off heat to the object and the thermal response is measured by uh, the heat camera. And by analyzing this data, uh, people in thermography can find out if there are some defects in this object. So you see that the robot can easily perform this inspection path. So uh, because it's, uh, we'll do that for a while, I'll have now some time to summarize what I did. Uh, first, I've made an automated algorithm to generate inspection paths uh, for a robot. There is a problem with uh, uh, interacting with it if you're not an expert. And to circumvent that, I uh, made an, a virtual reality interface that empowers users to do it themselves by helping them. Uh, this is not uh, your pain uh, it's not the same inspection quality as the automated algorithm, but you can go on if there is a problem. Uh, finally, I made an algorithm if you want to use this inspection on thousands of objects to figure out the details of the path to make it more efficiently executable by the robot. <laughs> then I also took a detour along a different kind of problem, the camera network design problem, and investigated how users can uh, manually interact with this problem and solve it themselves. And it turned out that people are actually quite good at that, even uh, better sometimes than an optimal algorithm to do that. And I think this is about everything I prepared. So uh, you may now remove the virtual reality headset. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It was a bit chaotic because we had some uh, technical difficulties. But yeah, I hope that not too many people uh, got sick. Uh, 
And I finally hope that I inspired some people to do the same and explore uh, 3D videos and presentations in VR also, because I also wanted to be in the audience of somebody that does this. So, and that's about everything. <laughs>